Well, good afternoon, everyone. I am Beck Seho, the Executive Director of United and Homelessness with Orange County United Way, and welcome to our July community chat. Last month, if you missed it, we had a community chat talking about the history of racial discrimination and housing in Orange County. If you missed that and you'd like to check it out, please feel free to go to our YouTube channel and our Facebook page, and you'll be able to find it there. I'm really excited for our conversation today. We're gonna to be talking about the 2022 point in time count. We sent out a summary of the data for everybody who wanted to review that. And we know that there's been a lot of questions about this count, media coverage about this count. And so I'm really thrilled to have Matt Bates and Doug Becht join me today so that we can have a deep conversation about the count and what this data means for our community. We're not gonna spend much time digging into the actual data. There's been a lot of great work done to promote the results of the count out in the community. And I'm sure we'll pop a link in the chat box for you so you can follow along with that data report. Um, but today we're really gonna be discussing what can the point in time count tell us? What are the limitations of a point in time count? And what do we do with the data that we have? And what questions is it now causing us to ask? about the work happening here to end homelessness in Orange County. So with that, I would love to introduce our guest today. And Doug, I'll come to you first. Who are you and how were you involved in the Point in Time Count? Uh, good afternoon, Bex, thank you. I am Doug Beck. I'm the Director of the Office of Care Coordination here at the County of Orange. Um, I oversee our Office of Care Coordination. And where we come into play with the Point in Time Count is, is that, um, we are, our office and, and the county is the administrative entity for the COC. Um, the point in time count is a COC function or activity. It's required by HUD. Uh, so as the administrative entity, we are, uh, we administer and coordinate uh, the point in time count, everything from the planning, uh, the, uh, the actual event, and then uh, processing and uh, publishing the results and making sure that they get to HUD. And then uh, obviously, as Matt will introduce himself, CityNet is, is uh, we contract out with CityNet to be the project lead and they just do a tremendous amount of work uh, around this event. Before I come to Matt, um, another just little bit of context setting, what is the COC that you mentioned? Oh yes, so the COC is the continuum of care. I'm, I apologize for that. It's a uh, federally required, uh, by local uh, body that helps um, the federal government prioritize and um, review, analyze, and set um, the goals for a local um, community around addressing homelessness. And, and how that's helpful is, is that uh, this is the vehicle in which the federal government um, sort of funnels and uh, uh, their, their funding to the community through the, the COC. Wonderful, thank you. Matt, who are you? <laughs> thank you, well, that's a longer question that I have to answer, but uh, thank you, first of all, for to United Way and to UBEX for hosting this chat and uh, and for inviting me in. Um, as the, I'm an executive vice president for CityNet, as Doug, Doug mentioned, we um, are one of the contracted agencies for the point in time count. Our, particular area of focus is the unsheltered count. Um, so there are other multiple agencies that are contracted by the County of Orange, uh, the care, uh, Office of Care Coordination, um, to implement the entire count. Um, our part is everything related to the unsheltered count from early days to doing, you know, mapping of the county and trying to identify, you know, where homeless neighbors are likely to be located so that we can create the maps and put them in hands of the surveyors to volunteer recruitment to on the days of the event, um, deployment of uh, volunteers out in the field to collect the data, and then ultimately handing that data back over to the county. Thank you to both of you. We are just gonna dive straight in. Matt, what is the purpose of the point in time count? So the purpose of the point in time count is to give a snapshot or a a moment in time look at homelessness in Orange County or in a COC. And, and in the case of Orange County, the COC boundaries are the same as the county boundaries. So um, it, that data set is um, analyzed locally and nationally. Um, the count is 
uh, mandated to be repeated over time, um, at least every other year. Um, everybody across the country does it in the same window, which you have to do it in the last 10 days of January. Um, and you actually have to pick one day. So even though we deployed unsheltered volunteers over three days, we, the volunteers are all trained to ask questions about homelessness for that one particular 24 hour period. Um, it's, uh, it's important for uh, the you know, general audience to understand that um, this is homelessness as defined by HUD. Um, and not everybody's aware that there are other federal agencies with different definitions of homelessness. I was in a presentation earlier this month um, and a, a service provider that works with families in the school district put up a stat on their screen that there were 30,000 homeless children in Orange County. And of course, you know, we've got 5,700 that, that we identified in the point in time count. So is it 30,000 30, children or is it 5,700 individuals? And the answer is a yes, depending on the defini definition that you're using. The Department of Education uses a much broader definition of homelessness. Um, and that's important because what they're trying to do is they're trying to provide early intervention services for families that are living in motels, uh, that are doubled up in housing, that are couch surfing, um, those are those are situations that we don't count in the point in time count, but they are housing insecure, they're vulnerable to homelessness. And so the, the Department of Education through the school districts provides services to those families, which is very important. Another way of saying that is that the, the data that's collected by the point in time count is a critical data set, but it should be viewed in context of other data sets like the Department of Education data, the the data that the continu continuum of care collects through um, HMIS, which is the homeless management information system, um, poverty rates, uh, other, other, other important you know, US census data, other data sets, I think to view in this data in context, um, it tells us um, a particular, uh, it gives us a particular window on, on the, the head definition of homelessness, um, but we recognize and need to reckon with as a, as a system of care, that there are other vulnerable people that are outside of that definition or even outside of that time frame, that time window of the last 10 days in January that might become homeless the next month that we need to be that we need to be concerned with. Great. Thank you so much, Matt, for that. And I think one thing that you uh, mentioned that I just want to really highlight is that the point in time count is looking at that very specific window of time. So the point in time count is not an analysis of 12 months of homelessness in Orange County. So I think that's really important to remember that it's not a statement of there were X number of households experiencing homelessness over a 12 month period of time. It's saying that there were X number of households experiencing homelessness in this window of time. Um, Doug, is there anything that you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I just uh, really emphasize the point that you and Matt make the point in time count is a valuable data set for us but it is not the only data set i know that it's often it, it's it lends itself to be used in a friendly way because it provides a specific number instead of a census but it is a snapshot and really from our perspective as much as that data tells us we really use that data to sort of be that jump off for other questions. Uh, so it's not so much the finish line and you know this tells us everything about homelessness, but it, it, it opens it up to further analysis and areas that we should continue to look in, uh, ways that and reports that um, we should compare it with and how does one report compare to this report and what is it telling us? Uh, so yeah, I just always caution uh, folks to view the point in time count as the end all be all. It is important. Uh, we believe in the validity behind it, but uh, it is just one report uh, uh, amongst many that help us understand uh, who needs help and how can we help them. Great. That leads me into the next part that I really want to kind of dig into, which is around what can the point in time count tell us and what can't the point in time count tell us. So one question that we had that came in was that there's a city in South County saying that because there was a decrease in their point in time count numbers between 2019 and 2022, apparently they're saying that they don't need to build a shelter 
or provide additional resources to address homelessness. And so Matt, I'm gonna to come to you. Is that an accurate way to read the point in time count or is there more to the story? Sorry, I muted myself to, if there was any background noise, but I think there's more to the story is the, is the short answer. Um, I, I do think that those are the kind of questions that should be that should be asked. And we should be looking at this data set and other data sets to answer those questions. So I want to affirm the, the question, you know, should there should we build a shelter and where should we build it if so, and what type of shelter and how, to serve how many and to serve who and what areas. These are all important discussions um, that should be asked. Um, but I also think that, you know, you need to look um, not again, not only at this data set, but other data sets and other other sources of intervention um, and whether they're geographically located. So in that particular question about South County, I think they, you know, I, I would encourage the those that are asking those questions in those cities to look at even if there are shelter beds available across the county, where are they located and who has access to them? Um, because I think that there is data within the point in time that was collected within the point in time count that can answer that question. Um, but I don't think it's as simple as just saying, well, there was a 16% reduction in, in homelessness from the, you know, the 2019 count to the 2022 count. And so if we just keep going on the path that we're going, you know, we're going to reduce it down to zero. Um, I would love for that to be true. And I do think we need to keep going on the path that we're going, but I also think that we need to be smart about our assessments and our interventions. Um, and I think that, you know, again, this is the, to me, this is the really useful part, this after part of, of the data. There's an opportunity here to do some data analysis and, and to really measure our interventions, both historic interventions and planned interventions against that data to make sure that we're doing the right things with the limited resources that we have. The goal of the point in time count is really just to kind of give us a picture of the reality, kind of a snapshot of here's what we're dealing with. And here's what here's how it compares to previous years or pre, you know, going back to the times that we've that we've been doing the, the point in time counter in, in this continuum of care. But the really exciting opportunity is that data analysis and the and the intervention part. Um, and to give us a statistical baseline against which we can measure those eff efforts over time. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of follow-up questions, but Doug, was there anything you wanted to add in here? Yeah, uh, you know, this goes back to the other question and, and Matt really hit it. The homelessness is really complex and there are so many reasons why people fall into homelessness um, and so many reasons. So, so the point, time count, yet again, to stress that it shouldn't be the end all be all. And you'll hear in a little later, in, um, a decrease isn't a time to say, okay, let's, you know, throw it into neutral and, and get there. But it's really a, a something to say, hey, we're encouraged and we really need to double down on our efforts. And I think it would be dangerous to say, okay, well, we saw a decrease, so we don't have to provide more resources because things are just going really well for us. I, that's a really dangerous uh, stance to take if that's the one that, that any group, wherever they are located, uh, are, are interested in taking. Thank you. I'm gonna do a couple of rapid fire questions so that we can get moving through our agenda because I know the three of us could talk about this for a long time. Okay, rapid fire question. Are people who pass away while experiencing homelessness, are they counted, are they accounted for in the point in time count, Matt? No, uh, because we're only counting the people that uh, on that one particular day that we encounter unsheltered homeless. So another question that's been asked, if, if somebody was in a motel that night, but we know that they were homeless the next day, do we count that person? And the answer is no, because we're instructed to only count those that are unsheltered homelessness. If they're paying for the motel by themselves, uh, then they're considered sheltered for that night. So. So the answer, the short answer and the longer answer is no. Thank you. And similar to that, people who might have moved away from the county, um, I'm guessing that that would not be captured in the, in the point in time count. That was another question that we had. Yeah, that's correct. Um, you know, and, it, and again, that, that kind of, in, in these kind of uh, survey-based counts, that goes both ways. So, you know, we count the people that we see 
And that could be people that, that have come in just for that day. And there may be somebody else that was there the night before and has moved, moved away. We're just counting the people that we physically encounter. Um, so that's a, you know, another point from a methodology standpoint is that Orange County does not use any kind of uh, statistical sampling or extrapolators in its count. It's just what we see. That's great, which leads me beautifully into my next question and next segment of our agenda. So in Orange County, over the years that we've been doing point in time counts, there have been a couple of different ways and a couple of different methodologies that have been used. But one thing that I know I had been so excited for was a repeat of the methodology that was used in 2019 to happen in 2022. And so in prior years, there had been extrapolation of the data. And I think that's important for people to realize. So if you're looking at point in time count data prior to 2019, it is not an apples to apples comparison. But what was so exciting was that 2019 to 2022, it was a very purposeful decision to keep the same methodology so that we could do some comparisons. With that, we know that there have been questions about the validity and the accuracy of the data. And there's been a lot of people wondering what was the impact of the COVID pandemic on the ability to do the count. And so Doug, I'm gonna come to you. Can you tackle this question for us first? Yeah, it's a good segue. Um, we are excited for 2022 because it, it was the same, uh, almost identical, uh, methodology. There was one change uh, that was very minor, uh, but we surveyed folks the same way. We plan the same way, uh, meaning, you know, um, in our preparation, we uh, worked with local outreach teams, law enforcement, community stakeholders to identify locations that we uh, consider hotspots for the purposes of making sure, although we canvassed the entire county, but making sure that we uh, absolutely counted the places where we would expect to see people. Um, COVID made it difficult. We had a little less volunteers, but with that being said, our, we had just as many teams go out. The teams just weren't as large as they were in 2019. Those teams went out uh, and covered the exact same area they covered in 2019, which was all of Orange County. Um, and they covered it just as many times as they had previously done in 2019, which was uh, twice and and some uh, were covered more than twice. And, and the way you're able to do that is, is we have a unique identifier. So there's some data. We don't take down names, but we take down unique information from individuals to ensure that um, when we're reviewing the data after the count, that if an individual filled out two surveys, we could see that and we could you know, uh, reduce that survey down to one and say, okay, these two surveys actually represent one individual. Um, and then I think the other thing that's worth noting about the validity of, of uh, this count is that um, that we actually were able to survey. So there's for those of you that don't do the count, you either survey an individual, either they allow you to survey them when you come across them, or if they say, no, thank you, I don't want to be surveyed, you mark down um, you know, whether or not you believe that that person's experiencing homelessness. Obviously, surveying an individual is probably going to get you a better answer than your own observation. And we actually, um, uh, in 2019, 60% of the people we counted were surveyed. This time, 70% of the people that were counted were surveyed. So, um, you know, I, 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 I don't, there's ways we can improve uh, here and there. But I think ultimately, uh, when you go out and you physically count everyone you come across, um, you probably have a better count than extrapolation or sample sizing, uh, sample size. So, you know, we really uh, are proud of our methodology. We, we spend the time in between counts ensuring that if there's little ways to improve, that we improve, so. Thank you. Um, Matt, I'm gonna move us on, but if you have anything burning, speak now or forever hold your peace. Well, I would just say, <laughs> yeah, just to add to it uh, very briefly, um, you know, we, even though the count is one day, HUD allows for 10 days of data collection. You just have to ask the question, were you homeless on date X, that one day? And so um, we were very careful and very conscientious to go back and revisit maps. So if, if a volunteer showed up on a deployment center on one of the mornings or evenings of the count, and maybe there was fewer volunteers than, than they remember seeing from two years prior, um, that is 
totally valid. Uh, but what we did as a collective, as a continuum, is we were able to, if there were maps that hadn't that we couldn't cover during that deployment center, we could send teams back out, and we did. So overall, as Doug mentioned, you know, we put in the same effort um, in terms of sending teams out to the maps, and most maps were covered multiple times. And then even within the shift, you know, the teams were instructed to go back to those hotspot areas twice. So we're as confident as, as we can be in the methodology. Thank you so much for, for both of those really thoughtful and comprehensive answers. Okay, now we are going to turn to the data. And really, my question is, you know, we've had the initial summary report that's been released about the data. And we are aware that there were 5,718 people counted during the point in time count, a 16% overall decrease from 2019. But there was a decrease seen in the number of veterans, families, and transitional age youth um, between 2019 and 2022. And, but there was an increase in the number of seniors experiencing homelessness from 2019. These are some of the very big picture pieces of data that, that we found in the count. But Doug, I'm curious from your vantage point, um, and it doesn't have to be the data that we just saw, what were the main takeaways from the point in time count um, from the data? What is it that really kind of resonated with you that you think it's really important for us to look into? Yeah, so obviously, I've, you know, we've spent a tremendous amount of time looking at this and evaluating it. And there's really two things that uh, we've taken away and we hope others take away. The first is, is we're encouraged by the decrease and we do think that um, all of the resources that were added into our system, uh, the county, city and private level over the last three years contributed to that. With that being said, um, that's not, like I said before, uh, us uh, time to sit down and, and just relax. It, it, what it says is we've got a lot of work to do because there's still over well over 5,000 people experiencing homelessness. And if we have a ton of work to do and we should be encouraged by the work that we're doing and we see that it, hopefully that it's making a, a difference, but we need to double down on that. Um, and then the second piece um, is that the, the main thing that the data showed us besides the decreases is that the people that are still experiencing homelessness um, are reporting at a greater rate of being, like you mentioned, Bex, uh, as seniors. We're seeing people presenting with greater presenting problems such as, or di uh, disabling conditions such as reporting mental illness, substance use, um, uh, uh, victims of and survivors of domestic violence. So what it really tells us is, is that uh, I think that we have to be really, continue to be really um, centered and focused on our services to ensure that uh, we are serving the population that seems to be aging and having um, you know, more issues in their lives. And we need to make sure that those services address that particular population. Uh, the data is telling us something, our system needs to respond to it. Thank you so much for, for highlighting that. And I just wanna kind of echo echo what you just said and make sure that, that everybody watching really heard that, that the data is, yes, there are things from the data that we can be um, grateful for. And there are questions certainly that we need to be asking around what led to some of these results. But, but I am encouraged to hear that you in your position are, are seeing that need for people who are experiencing homelessness, who are living outside in our community, who are, who are aging, who are extremely vulnerable, who've got significant health challenges, and that these are the people that we really need to get our attention focused on, and that these are the people we know from the cost study that are, that are the most expensive for us to leave, <clears throat> excuse me, out experiencing homelessness um, on our streets, and that we really need to keep our focus on providing best practice solutions. Uh, to be able to help them resolve their homelessness. Yeah, I mean, it, I'm sorry, Bex, but these are our most vulnerable neighbors. Uh, mm -hmm. So if that isn't a call to action, and uh, I, I don't know what is, we really need to be focused uh, on our work ahead of us. Thank you, Doug. Matt, anything to, that you want to add here around the data? Like, what is the data telling us? What do we need to take from it as we move forward? 
Yeah, I think I'd agree with what's been said. I just would kind of add that, um, you know, if you think back to COVID-19, global health crisis, unlike what we've seen in over 100 years. And as a result of that, um, attention and, and resources uh, were able to flow towards homelessness that, um, that impacted people's lives permanently, got them connected to permanent housing. And there are people that are housed today because of COVID that wouldn't have been otherwise. And I think when we're looking at this vulnerable population, including those that are aging, um, if we know nothing else, we know that if they still manage to stay alive as homeless, they're gonna be that much older in the next point in time count. And so if we can act like we're in a crisis now, because we are, and get out ahead of some of these things that are coming, um, then I think that's when, as a continuum of care, we've really matured to not just responding to the latest crisis that comes across our desk, but to use this data uh, to get out in front as best we can so that we're not having you know elderly senior homeless neighbors dying on our streets and i know that they're that they are now um but if we could cut that rate down um we know uh by looking at things like what's happened with with veterans as a subpopulation over the years in orange county that that we can coordinate and we can make a huge difference and so i just would you know my call would be towards my colleagues within the continuum of care is to take this data and to really use it smartly to advocate uh, for additional change so that it's not so that we're not always just having to respond to the latest crisis that we can take this and say this is a crisis and so therefore let's act now before it gets worse thank you um the the words that i just heard from both of you are really reminding me of some words that that those of us who are at the national Alliance and homelessness conference heard the White House domestic policy advisor from Ambassador Susan Rice. And she shared during some remarks that the average lifespan of someone who's experiencing homelessness is 30 years less than other Americans. And she said, we can and we must do better. And I think that's a really powerful place for us to, to wrap up this conversation right now. Um, my final question, because we are getting so close to time, when is the next point in time count? So we've got, uh, so we're required to do it every other year. Um, I think that we're looking at potentially 2024. We, there's some thoughts about doing some stuff uh, in this upcoming year, but we're just not at a point to, to say exactly uh, when the next count is. At very worst, it will be 2024. Okay, so more to come in terms of when the next point in time count is. Um, I know that we had uh, quite a few discussions around not looking at the point in time count as data in a vacuum, but it needs to be looked at alongside other data sets. And for anybody who's interested, the continuum of care has a ton of data um, and data reports that the COC is required to send to HUD. Um, those reports are publicly available. Um, and so those are, they are on, I believe, 211's website. Um, and if I've got that wrong, Doug is going to jump in and correct me. Well, I'm sorry, the results are, yeah, they're also on HCA's, uh, the healthcare agency. The healthcare Orange agency, County. fantastic. So healthcare agency's website, Continuum of Care, Orange County, tons of data there. And if you are somebody who's interested in data in your area, you are always welcome to submit a data request to the Continuum of Care. There's a whole process for how those get reviewed. But you know, if you're out in the community and you are curious around what data could look like, that is another avenue that you have um, to access different types of data that is available. And so I just wanna say a huge thank you, um, Doug and Matt for taking the time to be here today to walk through this. And a huge thank you to everybody that tuned in. This conversation that we had today was based on the questions that you guys sent. So you really shaped the agenda for us today. So thank you so much for that. Um, there'll be a quick poll popping up for those who joined us on Zoom. Uh, we always want your feedback on how to help make this space even better. And we look forward to joining you next month for our August community chat. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.